It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr., United States representative from New York. Well, Mr. Roosevelt, we're very happy to welcome you to the Chronoscope program this evening. I'd like to begin by asking you what you thought of the charges that Senator McCarthy made against uh, Governor Stevenson. Well, Mr. Hazlitt, first of all, may I express my gratitude for your inviting me here tonight. As for the McCarthy speech tonight, I unfortunately was not able to see all of it, hear all of it. I did uh, get the last part of it where uh, the senator from Wisconsin was once again uh, bringing in the affidavit that uh, Governor Stevenson made in the Hiss trial, in which, of course, Governor Stevenson testified in writing by his affidavit only to the fact that when he knew Hiss in the State Department, Hiss then had a reputation, a good reputation in the community. And that was all. Uh, but Senator McCarthy, as usual, uh, tried to read much more into it. No, well, sir. do you think that uh, Governor Stevenson showed good judgment in making that deposition? I think that as an attorney and as a citizen uh, in our procedure of justice in the courts, uh, he had, had an obligation to state what he knew about the reputation Hiss had in the community at that time. It was not his uh, opinion of Hiss's reputation, it was his uh, opinion of the reputation Hiss had in the community at that time. Well, granted that uh, he had the duty to speak, if he thought that a uh, perjurer was a loyal citizen, uh, did it show good judgment in thinking that? Well, of course, uh, he had not been convicted of perjury at the time that uh, Governor Stevenson made that uh, affidavit. Uh, that was the decision of the jury uh, after the Hiss trial. Well, and you the think first Hiss trial was a hung jury, you know. Well, do you think it would show that Governor Stevenson can't tell a communist when he sees one, so to speak? No, I don't think it don't shows think that so. at all. Well, <laughs> I sir, think now, that's what McCarthy would like it to show. On the McCarthy speech, sir, uh, do you think that it might be effective for the Republicans? Well, not having heard the whole speech, I can't say. I don't think that McCarthy is effective for the Republicans for one very simple reason, that I think the American people have realized that McCarthy has crucified the character and the reputation without evidence of too many Americans. And secondly, that not one single person has been convicted as a result of Mr. McCarthy's uh, efforts. Well, moving now, the on. Justice Department at the same time has convicted 33 well-known communist leaders. Well, moving on to the, to the campaign, sir, uh, I believe that you at least made one favorable statement about General Eisenhower in 1948. Did you in March not? of 1948, I did make a statement saying that I felt that General Eisenhower could unify the country. Now, I sir, when, when did your uh, enthusiasm begin to lag for General Eisenhower? Within the three weeks that followed that statement, I discovered that the impressions that I had of uh, General Eisenhower's position on the issues uh, could not be verified, and that General Eisenhower did n neither uh, would express himself on the issues, nor was he a candidate. Where did those impressions come from, Mr. Roosevelt? That was 1948. I'd say that they probably were a general idea that people had about the fact that Eisenhower at that time uh, ha certainly was a very humane and a great military leader and uh, certainly was highly respected both here and, and throughout the world. I think he still is respected and, and admired as a great military leader. Well, now, about the campaign that the Democrats have waged against General Eisenhower, do you feel, sir, that uh, any of the charges leveled at him have been unfair? Well, I uh, haven't documented all the charges that have been leveled against him. I've been pretty busy being positive in this campaign on behalf of Governor Stevenson and, of course, my own re-election. I'd say that uh, the main charge against General Eisenhower has been 
Not that he has failed to repudiate McCarthy and Jenner, who crucified uh, his own great uh, hero, General Marshall, uh, but that he has positively gone out and endorsed these people, the very essence of the old God Republicans. And I think that the charge that he is now a captive of the old God is a justified charge. I think that can be shown by his acceptance of Senator Taft's prepared statement, prepared in Cincinnati, and he brought it to uh, Columbia for his meeting with Eisenhower, and Eisenhower accepted it. Well, it's a, for, a great crime for Mr. Eisenhower, who is running on a Republican ticket, to be supporting, so to speak, the views of Mr. Republican. Well, he, uh, he conquered Mr. Republican at Chicago and then was conquered by Mr. Republican at Columbia University. I don't think it's a crime. Of course not. He's, <laughs> this is a free country. I don't think it will help him, though, with the American people because I don't think that Senator Taft is... A, well, he wasn't nominated by the Republicans, so he doesn't even have the Republican well, sir, support. Two questions on President <coughs> Truman. In the first place, sir, do you think that any of Truman's tactics have been unfair in this campaign? I think that uh, it's hard to say that they're unfair for the simple reason that we know Harry Truman is a tough fighter in any campaign. That's how he won the election in 1948. I think that some of the things he has said have hurt some people and their sensitivities. On the other hand, I think he has aroused the Democratic Party and I think that his uh, campaigning has been helpful. Well, I'm well, sure... Mr. I... Roosevelt, I'd like to ask this question, whether that isn't applying a sort of double standard. Now, uh, why can't you say about Senator McCarthy, he's a tough fighter and he's been effective? Uh, why is it all right, let well, us I say, for... Well, I don't think you ought to compare uh, Truman to well, McCarthy. Why, well, I'm asking you why you apply what seems to me a double standard of, uh, of uh, innuendo. How about the uh, innuendo that Mr. Truman made that uh, General Eisenhower was anti-Semitic and anti-Catholic? He so didn't... On. Now, uh, wait a minute. He did not say that. We well, made the innuendo, I no. said. No. What he said was that... And actually, he didn't even deliver the speech himself, although he approved the speech. What he said was that General Eisenhower was now endorsing positively those men who had passed and supported the McCarran bill, which is selective and anti-racial. Mr. Roosevelt. It's anti-Polish, it's anti-Italian, it's anti-Eastern European, and so forth. Well, Governor Stevenson hasn't been repudiating any of the candidates who, the Democratic candidates who favored the McCarran bill. There's a difference bill, between he? repudiation and endorsement. That's all that Truman said, that Eisenhower has gone out of his way to endorse these candidates. Well, hasn't Mr. Stevenson endorsed some of the people who voted for the McCarran Act, the Democrats? I, I don't know. Yes. I don't uh, know if uh, Governor Stevenson has endorsed anybody. Yes. It hasn't been heralded, such as the endorsements Mr. of McCarthy and <coughs> Mr. Roosevelt, so I'm sure that our viewers want to know something about you and your own campaign, sir. You, after all, you represent one of the big west side districts in New York City. Right. Now, how's, yeah, your own, how's your own campaign going? Well, I've been spending five days a week, uh, four or five meetings a night, uh, meeting with my constituents discussing the issues with them. I have a very interesting district. It's a very independent district. I'd say that it is liberal, it's progressive. Of course, I hope they uh, re-elect me to Congress. Well, uh, you won on a Four Freedoms uh, platform, didn't you? The first uh, yes. time I ran, I, I ran on the Liberal Party candidacy yes. and also the independent Four Freedoms Party it, candidacy. It's a traditionally democratic uh, constituency, isn't it? No, I'd say that it's traditionally independent. Uh, in, in 1949, they elected me. I was not the Democratic candidate. Uh, then they voted for uh, Mayor Impellatieri quite overwhelmingly when he ran as an independent in 1950. And they voted for uh, Mr. Halley when he ran as an independent and the Liberal Party candidate in 1951. And uh, one other question about the family, sir. I believe that uh, one of your brothers is supporting General Eisenhower. Now, yes. is this unusual, a, a defection in the Roosevelt family like this? No, I, I don't think it's particularly unusual. We practice what we preach in the uh, Roosevelt family. We believe in freedom of speech, freedom of thought, and the right of everyone to express himself freely and if he feels called upon to do so. I, frankly, though, I don't think Johnny's going to influence any votes. I don't think I am, <laughs> but I think my mother is. Well, what are, is your mother taking an active part in the last few days of the campaign? She certainly is. She's introducing Governor Stevenson to the Madison Square Garden rally tomorrow night. And as, as a final question, Mr. Roosevelt, uh, do you expect any dramatic moves in the last part of the campaign? 
No, I don't look for any dramatic moves. Uh, I think that General Eisenhower shot his wad when he said he'd go to Korea personally. What he'd do when he got there, he didn't say. I think that the American people will vote to continue the prosperity under the Democrats and continue the hope for peace in the world through the United Nations, the Point Four program, well, and NATO. Well, thank you, sir, for being with us. Thank you. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr., United States Representative from New York. During the past weeks, the words of some of our speakers, spoken during the heat of the political campaign, have evoked considerable comment and occasional criticism. Now, at this time, the Longines Whitnor Watch Company puts aside its usual commercial message to give our editors an opportunity to explain to you the policy of the Longines Chronoscope. For this purpose, we present Mr. William Bradford Huey. As a magazine editor, about uh, once a year, I give a policy statement to the readers. And tonight, as an editor of the Chronoscope, I'll give a policy statement to you. Longines Whitnor began this program first on a once a week basis and now for more than a year we've operated three times a week uh, over a very large nationwide network and we are pleased that uh, so many of you have liked the program now here's what we do regardless of political persuasion we bring the most important people in America right into your living room we seat them comfortably and then in a forthright but friendly manner, we ask them the questions that we think you would like to ask. And in doing this, we take risk. It's a hazardous business of bringing a, a guest into other people's living rooms. And sometimes when we bring a rather controversial character on one side or the other, uh, you don't like him. And a great many of you protest. Now when this happens, we are sorry. But quite honestly, uh, what can we do? Neither I, nor the sponsors, nor the network exercise any control over what's said. We are not censors. We have to take the risk, you and I, of free speech. We ask the questions, and you take the risk, forget what answers you get. Then, too, we editors are, are often criticized because we don't rip into some guest, because we don't try to refute what he has to say or to embarrass him. And I particularly uh, get criticized because as a writer, I have some reputation as a ripper. But here, we don't do any ripping. We don't smash any ink wells. And we are quite proud of the fact that in all our programs, we've never had a guest who went away thinking that he'd been treated unfairly. So during our second year, we expect to bring you stimulating, provocative views from the most active men and women in the world. You examine them. You look into their eyes on these big TV close-ups and you decide what you think of them. Now that's our policy. Thank you. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor watches.